Hey folks, I'm Erin from Futurely and I'm a procedural artist from the UK. In this session today, we're going to be taking a look at Sverchok, which is the parametric modeling tool for Blender. Blender doesn't really have much of a history of parametric workflows, procedural design, computational design, and all of this. However, you know, we're starting to move in the right direction with things like geometry nodes, but it's just too young to really be able to be used for this stuff. Sverchok, on the other hand, has been around for a little while. It's kind of, you can think of it like Blender's response to Grasshopper. So in this session today, I'm going to be assuming a little bit of Blender knowledge. The majority of what we will be doing is through Sverchok anyway, so it'll be all node-based. However, we will just be doing a little bit in the viewport. You will see my shortcuts on screen, and uh, I will be kind of talking through what I'm doing. Now, let's start right at the beginning. Let's make sure that we all have Sverchok. It doesn't come with Blender. We need to go and download it. So jump over into your search engine and search for Sverchok. With Google, the top result that comes up here is Nautikin Sverchok Public GitHub. This is the one that we want to jump into here. So the way that you generally get add-ons for Blender is you download a zip file from the GitHub. And to do this, we just need to go across the code on the right-hand side and click Download Zip. Now, Sverchok is not a big download, something like seven megabytes. So it should download fairly quickly. All right, now I'm gonna jump into Blender. What I've got here is a clean install of Blender 2.93. So this is the current LTS release. And we're just going to start off by installing the add-on. So come up to Edit Preferences. And in this new window, we can go into Add-ons and click Install. Navigate to where you saved the Sverchok Master Zip and select this and install it. This will take a few moments just to install the module. And then you will find it in your add-ons list here. We can just check this box and it's going to enable the nodes. Now we do have a few additional settings in here if you would like to have a look. However, we don't need to for this lesson. In the course that we're producing over on the Futurely platform, we do actually use some of these extra nodes, things like Voronoi and uh, the GeoMDL ones for NURBS. However, we're not gonna need these today. If you do want to install them and you run into trouble, if it does say it fails, then you might just need to give Blender admin privileges. That's, uh, that's only the only real extra step there. We're done with this, so let's go ahead and close the preferences and we can start actually working on creating a bit of a workspace here. So Blender's UI is fully customizable. We can go over to the edge of something till we get our double-ended arrow and you can see we can change the size of things. We can also make a new workspace. So these tabs along the top are workspaces. What we're gonna just do here, right click on layout, hit duplicate, this is gonna make a new one. Double click on this layout name and let's just call this one Sverchok. So now you can see I have a second tab just for Spurchock here. What we'll be doing is joining a few of these together. We don't want windows as we have them here. So let's go ahead and just, when our mouse changes, we can right click and join areas. So let's drop our 3D viewport down. We can separate in the same way. So let's go for a vertical split. And we're gonna have our Spurchock nodes in the middle. Each one of these windows can be set to any other window. This is one of the great things about Blender. We can set our middle section here to Sverchok nodes. And there we go, now we have Sverchok. On this left-hand side, let's go ahead and give this one a couple of splits as well. Always useful to have a text editor for debugging. And uh, let's go for another one horizontal split. Let's stick a timeline at the bottom, which can just help us if we do need to change frames and things like this. So I'm just gonna make that small have a text editor, we have a 3D viewport. We can press N to minimize, to minimize that on the left-hand side there, and T to get rid of that left-hand panel. And if we want Blender to remember that we have this tab for Sverchok, what we can do is save a new startup file. I'm gonna go into this first tab here, and I'm actually gonna delete everything just so that we have a clean file. So I'm gonna select everything and then hit X to delete. And now I can save this as a new startup. So go File, Defaults, Save startup file, confirm that. And now every time we open Blender, it's gonna remember empty file, which is always very useful. And we have a tab for Sverchok. All right, let's jump in here. 
So what we're going to do first is actually add some curves and create a surface across them. This is going to give us 3D workspace, 3D viewport controls for actually generating a procedural model. And doing things with curves allows us a lot of control later in very sort of relatively simplistic input. So just in our 3D viewport here, we're going to go ahead and press Shift A to add a curve, Bezier curve. And if we want to zoom in here, I can just use the scroll wheel. If I want to pan around my view, that's pressing and holding the middle mouse. And we can shift middle click to pan sideways. If you don't have a scroll wheel, you can also press control, middle click. Or if you prefer to use the gizmos on the right hand side here, then you can just use those. We have one for moving around. We can also jump into our orthographic views with this. And we have zoom pan and the bottom two will just jump into camera if you have a camera and switch between orthographic and perspective so very useful so that's that let's jump into edit mode now so that we can actually modify our points on this curve i'm going to press tab to jump into edit mode and now i can actually start modifying this so i could grab one of these curve handles and move it around if i want to select multiples here i can right click subdivide and now if I want to move this third one, let's press G, so G for grab. And then you can also press S to scale or R to rotate. Pressing R twice gives you trackball rotation. So that's basically all of your controls there. So I'm just going to be rotating these with trackball rotation and scaling them and grabbing them to give myself a little bit more, uh, a little bit more shape. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a sort of general first shape, sort of generic shape here. And I'm going to tab out of edit mode. And now what I can do is press shift D to duplicate. Let's press Y to move this in the Y axis. And then I'm going to press left click to confirm that action. Rather than having to do this multiple times, I can just press shift R to repeat the last thing we did. So shift R a few times there just to give us a few curves. Now, if you want more space in your 3D viewport, you can press control space. And that is going to maximize a window, whichever window your mouse is over, it's going to maximize that one. Okay, let's give our curves a little bit of a different shape. We're going to just randomize this a little bit here. Just literally box selecting. I might make additional uh, subdivisions and I'm just scaling and rotating and grabbing just to create a little bit more of a freeform flowing shape in here we don't need to worry about these being planar they can be any sort of 3d shape our surface is just going to loft across them nice and easy so maybe this one comes out a little bit i'm going to select all and then subdivide to give me the sides and i'll bring out the bottoms there and i'll just bring in these like so give that a little bit of a folded shape at the end might be quite nice. All right, let's create a surface across these. In the Svertok, we're going to create a new node tree, this button at the top. And now we have a node tree that we can start processing data. We have things in our scene and we want to bring them into Svertok. So we're going to use a node called the Bezier in because these are Bezier curves. So let's do this scene because it's from our scene and Bezier in. Let's make things a little bit easier in our menus. Let's first of all turn on icons as well. That's just going to save us a bit of time. Press N to bring up your side panel here. Sverchok, tree UI, menu icons. And now we can see if we jump into our menus, a little bit of a visual aid. The Bezier Inn is not actually picking anything at the moment. We have our selection, so let's just hit get selection. And we can see at the bottom this has now been populated. We're going to go and just make a surface straight away here. So let's go ahead and use surfaces surface from curves because we have curves coming in and now we want to evaluate this surface so blender can see it again let's go ahead into our surfaces the last one on the list here is evaluate surface and we can just view it like so now to view the output we can press ctrl shift left click and you can see this just generated a mesh now if you're familiar with blender you will notice that this does not look like a standard mesh as you can see, it's bright blue and everything is showing. This is the temporal viewer. 
Spurtrock has a couple of different viewers uh, which don't actually output like real data. This is sort of a debug tool. We can have a look at specific things like vertices, edges, and faces, and we can toggle those, change the color, have a look at it with sort of smooth shading like this. But Blender doesn't actually have any new objects. This is just a visual aid for us to be able to debug what's going on. And because it's on a control shift left click shortcut, it's very, very easy for us to actually bring it into our scene. Now then, right now we have a linear interpolation between all of our different curves. Let's go ahead and change this to cubic. And there we go, that's a little bit nicer there. And we can now have a little bit more of a play. Let's expand this section again, control space. And I'm going to select one of my curves here. I'm just grabbing handles. You may notice that your handles actually go behind this Svirchok viewer overlay. So it can be a little bit annoying. If you do need to just disable it, you can click on the eye to toggle. Um, or you could use a, a mesh viewer output here. So visualize mesh viewer, and that's going to create an actual mesh. I'm going to just go with the temporal viewers for now, just because they're a little bit easier to work with sometimes. Let's toggle this back on control space, and I'm going to move a couple points in this one as well. Maybe make it a little bit higher, maybe subdivide this left hand side and bring it out a little bit there. Now, if I want this to update, what I can do is I can change the frame with an arrow key. So I can press left or right arrow, and that is going to update. It's going to trigger a frame change, which will tell Svirchok to update. Now, because a frame change will update Svirchok, what we can actually do is just play the timeline. Now, this depends on how you have Blender set up. By default, this will be space, but there is also a shift space option. And you can see that this number in the top left of my viewport is going around. Now, what happens if I start moving things around? is you can see that we have this updating more or less live. So it totally depends on how big or small your node tree is, whether or not this is kind of viable to do a live update like this. Sometimes things can get very, very heavy. And so it's actually a little bit prohibitive trying to get a live update out. But just at the moment, we only have a few nodes. So we can create something pretty interesting. All right. So we have this sort of shape, but we can take this further. Let's go ahead and actually put this along another curve. So instead of these being hand positioned, you know, profiles, we can just have these as sort of profiles on their own and position them in space procedurally, maybe along another curve. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select these curve objects and I'm just going to move them G and then X to move them in the X axis. There we go. And I'm going to trigger a frame update just to move our temporal viewer there. And what I'm going to do as well is I'm just going to add a Bezier curve. So let's go ahead and add another one. And if I go into top view by pressing seven on my number pad, I can create another spline. In fact, this spline, I'm going to extrude it a little bit as well. I'm going to do something like this. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Okay, obviously we can change this later. Procedural systems are incredible like that. You can essentially sketch out an idea for the relationships between something and then actually fine tune the details later. So it really is a great platform for sketching. Now we want to bring in our new curve. I'm going to use a new node here, just duplicating that Bezier in, get selection. And now we have this base curve. All right, so we want to find a few positions along it, and there's a special node for doing this called curve frames, or in this case, because we're twisting, we're going to use a curve zero twist frame. So curves, curve zero twist frame. Let's go ahead and throw this on here and have a look at what's coming out the other end. If we just view, here we go, view the matrix through our temporal viewer, you can see we get this little grid. Now a matrix is just a transform matrix in this case. So it has a location, a rotation and a scale. In this case, we're essentially just pulling out a location and rotation. We're not doing anything with scale. So you can see I can move this along my curve just by changing this T value. And in this case, if we have a look at our curve, 
we have one, two, three handles. So our domain for the curve is going to be zero to one and then one to two. So we're going to have a zero to two domain range. If I was to extrude this again, it would be zero to three and again, zero to four and so on. So if we want to save ourselves a little bit of a headache later on, something that we can do now is to reparameterize this curve just so that it has a zero to one all the time, we're essentially normalizing that domain. Let's go ahead and add a curve, reparameterize curve, and I will drop this on here. So the curve hasn't changed, but our zero twist frame is now only going to be on the curve between one and zero. That's just because these are the default values in here and I've left them as that. Okay. A lot of sockets in Svirchok can take multiple numbers, lists of data. So what we can do here, I know I have five curves, so I want to generate five matrices along this other spline. In order for us to do this, we can use a number range. So let's use a number range. We want numbers between zero and one, and we want five of them. So let's use count. We're going to go start zero, stop one, and count five. And now what this is going to be outputting is like zero, 0 0.2, four, uh, and so on. In fact, it's probably going 0, 2.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, and 1. So we can see that we now have five matrices going along our curve. Awesome. All we need to do now is actually put the first curves on them. There's a node for us to do this uh, to process curves with matrices, and this is actually called apply field to curves. So apply field to curves, this essentially means that we can use much more complex fields and a field is basically a 3D a continuous function where any point within that 3D space can be sampled and the, uh, the direction and the magnitude can be extracted as a force kind of thing. So you can essentially move values based on, um, yeah, on, on a field, which is really useful in this case because we can read a matrix as a constant field. So in this case, we're just going to drop this apply field to curves on our profile curves just before our surface from curves. And let's make sure this is going into the curve option here. We're going to be plugging our matrix into the fields. And now if I view the evaluate surface, we can see that this is going crazy. And this is actually because we've applied matrices already. You already have this offset here. And then it's also going to wherever it needs to be on the on the spline. So all we need to do is just turn off apply matrices. That's going to just zero out all of these curves, put them back onto the zero position. And then when we apply our field, apply our new matrices, it's just going to move them to those final positions. Okay, whole thing's going kind of weird. It's all flat. Reason for this being that we want to track the normal. So we can set this to track normal and that's going to make them all go more or less the same direction. And then if we're still having some issues like this, where things are kind of flopped over on their side, that's probably because these are actually stood up. Whereas if we look at our matrices over here, what we have is Z. Blender is a Z up uh, software. So we have Z going in this direction and then green, which is our Y direction is coming up. So really we want to be using um, curves which are kind of rotated over. Now if you have them stood up as we do here, what we can actually do is just apply another matrix to these matrices. Um, I'm just, there we go. So if I use a matrix math node, we can now start doing additional matrix work on here. Let's rotate these in the X axis. So let's change our axis to one in the X. And I'm just going to rotate these something like this. So we go minus 90 should give us a positive Z up. And then if we use this now for our fields, we should see that we have, there we go. We have our new tunnel, which is sort of following that secondary curve. If I press control space here, there we go. We can see that this is tracking along really nicely and it's still taking into account all of the shape of our profiles. These have been extruded along that curve. If I update one of these, then we're going to see that we're starting to get that change. 
if I want to spin this 180 degrees and then I can also apply the rotation and update this, then you can see that we're just tweaking that slightly differently at the end there. So you can have a lot of fun with doing this sort of freeform sculptural tunnel thing, but we're going to take it further. We're going to go down a little bit of a rabbit hole here of kind of instancing stuff on the surface and creating a pattern and then creating some kind of alien architecture thing at the end of it. So this whole section that we're just having a look at now, you can kind of go as far or as much or as little as you want and create some really crazy shapes. But it's all just a, a case of layering. That's all you find with proceduralism. It's a lot of simple processes, just doing them on repeat. Uh, so I think people get put off a lot by seeing people creating these insane procedural systems, especially when you look at things like Houdini. But actually when you look at the artists who are actually building them, going through them step by step, they're not so, they're not actually so crazy. Okay, so we're going to create a Voronoi on this surface. If we go into our spatial category, we can use a Voronoi on surface node, and it'll just plug that in like so, and view the outputs. Now this says no data passed into UV socket. So the UV points are essentially our Voronoi sites. So what we can do here is we can go into our spatial populate surface because we just want to generate points on the surface. And this one's quite important actually. If I press N on my Svertok tab, go into node timings. Let's just have a look at where we're at now. Let's plug in our UV points. This actually seems fairly quick to compute. If I increase my number of points here up to say 200 then uh, it's still actually doing all right uh, you'll notice everything's disappeared this is just because we're outputting vertices and edges so make sure that you have those enabled on your temporal viewer all right still everything's quite close together let's go a little bit higher 600 all right this is starting to take a little bit more time now so there is a setting on the populate surface node which by default is set to cull points that are within a certain distance. And the issue with this is it's very, very slow to do. So it's still not actually calculated yet. I'm just gonna fast forward this for you. Okay, we can see that there, 35 seconds to compute. I mean, that's just way too much. Let's change our max distance here to zero, sorry, our min distance. And there we go, 69 milliseconds, nice. So. We have our Voronoi on this surface now, so that's looking pretty good. And we can now do a few more things. Let's go ahead and add another node here called the subdivide node. So modifiers make subdivide. And this is a little bit different from the subdivide that we find on the modifiers list. What this one does is it will, it will maintain the number of faces, whereas the modify version is more like the node subdivide to quads which will actually do a little bit more kind of quad topology so this one is still very useful for us because we can come into edges and make a number of cuts along here and these are going to become points that we instance a sort of a motif shape on uh, it's going to allow us to create some really interesting unexpected geometry because this is now starting to work kind of outside what we're imagining if you design two things and then you just create thousands of that thing on one of the others, that's kind of where we're going with this. So what I really like about this subdivide node, when you have edges, if you make a load of cuts and you turn up the smooth, it kind of tries to follow the tangent. Uh, hopefully you can see that. Maybe if I turn off the vertex display there, you can see that this is coming much more flowing so you can get this sort of weave look almost, which I think is really nice actually. So you can set your smoothness to whatever you want. Now the Voronoi on surface does actually produce faces as well if you want it to. Oh, and that can be really fun for doing stuff like inset special. So we can just use this node, it's very fast. If I select these three and then press V, it's gonna automatically connect where it can. And then you you know you can change your inset value. You can maybe turn off make inner, and that's just going to create this kind of Voronoi shell. So that's kind of a nice way to work. What we're actually going to be 
doing here is, so we have our Voronoi, and let's start off with a very performant method, uh, which has a little bit of a shorter limit on the number of things that we can do. It's kind of one step and then we're done, um, but it means that we can't kind of continue making mesh operations. Whereas the second method I'm going to show you is much slower to to uh, to compute, but it allows you to continue on this journey of like making stuff in Svirchok or uh, even processing it in Blender as uh, with modifiers, which I might have a look at that actually, because we haven't really, we've not really touched on modifiers yet. So I've got these points. Let's go ahead and add a viz, which is our visualization category. We're going to be throwing in a dupli instancer. This is going to take advantage of Blender's built-in instancing system, which is extremely, extremely fast. And we're just going to use our vertices as the vertices. So this is essentially the locations. And then we can go ahead and actually make something to instance here. I'm going to do something fairly simple. I'm just going to use a mesh and I'm going to, if I press period on the number pad, we're going to zoom into that selection. Let's go ahead and press tab to go into edit mode and then M to merge. We're going to merge at the center just so we have a single vertex and I'm going to extrude this with E and let's bring this in the Y direction. Here we go. And let's also give it a couple of cuts with Control R and then I can scroll to set the number. Let's give it two cuts, which I will rotate in the X axis just to give it this kind of <laughs> like a lightning bolt shape. So there we go. You can make anything that you want. Literally, this is just going to instance any object that you choose. So I'm just making this sort of rod that we can then use a couple of modifiers on. Let's go ahead and subdivide to make it a smooth curve. Go up to two levels. And we're also gonna throw in a skin modifier. Now, if you wanna change the radius of this, tab into edit mode, select all of your points with A, and then press Control A to change the radius. I know it's a bit confusing. I'm gonna make these middle two a little bit plumper. Maybe I'll make them all a little bit up, actually. Um, and I might just take my two endpoints and scale them out and pinch them down a little bit with control A there. There we go. So I've just given myself a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a shape here. Something like that is fine. And let me just rename this as well. If I press F2, I can rename this one. I'm just going to name it to child. So I know what I'm looking for, there we go. And let's now select this in our child here. So you can either select it from the list, but if you have a lot of items in your scene, then you can also use the eyedropper and grab that. So this is all happening on top of our object. Let's go ahead and click this third icon here on the child, which is just going to clear the location. So this is going to go back onto our points. Awesome. So you can kind of see what's going on here. We're starting to get the Voronoi pattern, I've actually left the smoothing off here. If I turn that back on, so we're getting this pattern in here. It's looking pretty cool. I can maybe set smooth shading on my skin modifier there just to make them look a little bit softer. Damn, I really like how this is looking. You're starting to get a little bit of, you're getting still the sense of the tunnel although you would have to make the tunnel quite a lot bigger for it to actually still accommodate people walking through. But you do get this sort of sense of permeation and you could even get maybe light coming through here, which is cool. And because it's all extended, you've essentially got the sort of this expression of the Voronoi pattern happening at each end of this. So from each surface, you're getting that kind of broken up pattern. So anyway, this is working extremely extremely fast. We have like 17 milliseconds. I can still move around nice and easy. I can change my original object in here. Maybe if I were to extend another piece, then we could see that we have sort of an, a third expression of the Voronoi. I'm just going to delete that vertex with uh, X and then delete vertex. There we go. So I'm leaving this as is, but we can turn up our subdivide. Let's go up to 10. That's going to make this very dense. 
but at the same time it gives us more of a sense of surface. Now if you're interested in knowing how many of these objects you're actually making, then we want to count how many vertices we have. To do this we're going to want to use a list, list main, list length node. Plug this into your vertices and we can press control left click. Control left click is going to attach a temporal stethoscope. And the number that this puts out is one, no wait, <laughs> is 17,194. It's not a small number, it's quite a lot to be working with here. And so for the next part, we are going to turn it down a little bit. We could maybe reduce the number of points on our populate surface. So let's go down to 300 and that's going to make our cells bigger. Although it is going to make it easier for us to actually kind of uh, recognize these cells. Now, while we're still working in this kind of mode here with the Dupli instancer, we can have a look at what happens if we start moving these points around. So if I move this one and then update the node tree, we can see that we start getting more of this kind of horizon horizontalness. And because of the way that we're instancing this object, that's uh, it's got a kind of specific look to it. If we take the central point and we move it up and rotate that, then you can see that we're starting to get a little bit more variation here. And because we're reparameterizing this curve, if you remember we did this at the beginning, reparameterize curve, this means that we can actually extrude these as far as we want. And it's just going to keep creating kind of an extension of this pavilion. So you could do some very interesting freeform things here that's just kind of bringing stuff down and it creates these kind of um, sort of incidental structures because you're, you're not necessarily able to predict this stuff exactly because it is, you know, it is kind of so far removed from our inputs and that's quite exciting as a designer, I think. Let's go ahead and maybe make this a little bit um, less extreme. So I'm just going to bring you in, update that a little bit. And I might come into the side view and just make sure that I'm coming maybe down. And maybe that one comes up a little bit. Just give it a little bit more shape. There we go, something like this. I'm liking that. All right, so I have a shape that I quite like. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go for our, like our slow method, which doesn't unfortunately use Blender's Duplivert settings. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete my Dupli instance and node. You can see that our meshes are still here. It's because it, when you delete a node, it doesn't actually trigger the object being deleted. So let's just go ahead and delete that one as well. We can still see our temporal viewer processing these, outputting these. So what we're interested in now, we're only pushing out 8,200. I might still turn this down to seven, 6,000, I think is probably a good place to be aiming for here, just so that we're not having to uh, wait around too much for what we're about to do. You can always turn it up at the end, but I do recommend just while working with Svertrock, which is entirely based in Python, while you're using this tool set, I would definitely recommend turning down settings just while you build stuff up. Okay, I'm going to also just disable the make faces on that, which I'd had left on from before. And now we're going to grab our child object, this one here, and we're going to bring it in. So to bring in a mesh object, we're going to use the get object data node. Select this, get selection, and now let's have a look at the output. Here we go. So we just have these four points, and this is because the get object data by default does not look at the modifier stack. Not good enough. We need this to take into account the modifiers. So hit post. There we go. And I can just plug in my modifiers, my polygons there. And we can see that this is looking great. We have a lot of edged loops considering the kind of the simplicity of this shape. So I'm going to want to remove as many of these as possible. Let's go ahead and search for so search, by the way, is at the top of your node menu. If you ever watch other videos of people using Svertrock, you will probably notice that they search more often than using menus. This is just because it can be 
uh, it's a lot faster once you know what you're looking for. In this case, we're looking for limited dissolve. Let's just grab the regular one, select these three, let's press V to join everything together automatically. Now the angle here is in radians, so a default five is huge. Uh, let's set this down to point one. That's doing pretty good. And let's also use the dissolve boundaries just to make sure that we don't have anything too close together. Um, I might leave mine like this, which I feel like has relatively good topology. A couple of n-gons, but largely we do have these quads. There we go, nice. Not too much additional useless geometry. So I have this limited dissolve, and I have all of these points as well. There we go, all of these positions. We want to use these positions as locations. So whereas before we used an apply field to curves to bring matrices in to move stuff around, in this case, we're going to use the mesh equivalent, which is under transforms, the apply matrix apply verts. So I'm going to drop this on here. We're using it from our child object because it is the, uh, there we go, the child itself and the matrix input here. We're coming from our subdivide. These are all of our locations. And before I click that, I am going to save just to make sure that, uh, well, it's just good practice. Before you plug in any heavy calculations, always good to save. So this is just going to take a few moments to calculate. There we go. Not too bad. About six seconds for me there. And we can see that we're starting to get this pretty big shape, actually. So if I turn off my vertices and my edges, there we go. So we're just down to the meshes themselves. Now, this is going to look exactly how it did before, right? With the duplifier. But so why are we waiting six seconds now? Why do we need to go through this? Well, it's because we can now transform these as real geometry, which means that we can pass this out to Blender and apply modifiers to it. Let's go ahead and have a little play with that because that can be a really fun way to come up with some new forms. So rather than using our temporal viewer, I'm going to delete this and we're going to use a viz mesh viewer. And this just allows us to pass out meshes. Let's just save once again, always good practice. And let's go and plug in our vertices. This is going to take a moment. It's just going to load all of these. And then we're going to plug in our polygons as well. There we go. Now, at the moment, these are all separate objects. So on our mesh viewer, let's go ahead and click merge. And this is just going to, if you're familiar with Blender, this is like pressing control J. It joins two mesh objects into a single object. And um, because it's doing so many things, 6,000 objects here, it is just going to take a few seconds there, taking around 13 or 14 seconds just to compute. However, we have a lot of freedom now because this is an object. So if I just save here again let's jump into our layout tab and this is just going to give us a little bit more space to work in 3d and let's go and add a modifier on our wrench icon let's try a mirror modifier so that's pretty cool you could try bisecting in the x just so that you don't have any overlapping maybe we also want to do a y and a bisect in the y so we're able to start getting this pretty interesting kind of almost alien topology. Maybe we do it in the Z as well. So we're getting some, yeah, some real complexity in here. Now you could also use a mirror object instead of just using the X, Y, Y, Z planes, whichever. So let's go ahead and add an empty sphere. And I'm just putting this in a kind of random place right now. Let's go ahead and just hover over the mirror object, press E. This is going to bring up the eyedropper. Select our empty. And now we can see that we can move this around. And because we're using Blender now, the modifiers within Blender, we're able to do this in a relatively performant way. We can also try rotating things or, you know, rotate them in different angles as well to create different effects. Now, if I was to turn on my, all of my different axes here, then this is gonna have much more of an effect as we start rotating things around and changing things. 
So you can ha you can have a lot of fun with this. Just kind of seeing what kind of stuff you can come up with. If you ever want to reset the rotation on something, the shortcut is Alt R. So Alt R is just going to bring that back to zero rotation. And maybe if I bring this over here and then I flip the Y, then we're going to get this kind of shape out of both sides here. There we go. Okay, what happens if you want a more homogeneous surface? Right now it's all very bitty. I can understand why this might not appeal. So let's go ahead and add a remesh modifier. Again, remeshing is not something that you would have access to if we were still using the duplivert system. So on our voxel size, let's go and change this down to 0.05, just to kind of tighten this in a little bit. And we'll check on smooth shading. Cool, so we're starting to create something that's fairly... I mean, it's weird, right? It's not like stuff you would see on the high street. But you can see how this becomes quite an interesting and fun form finding exercise where we can start actually generating these kinds of novel topologies and shapes and things. And this is all still live. You know, if I go and jump onto my, uh, my original curve here and we maybe stop this from coming down quite so much. So let's bring it back up a little bit. I know I'm kind of moving stuff blind here, but if I just update the frame, press right frame there, and you can see that this has just created a little bit of a different shape. Now again, I'm just going to zero out with Alt R, that topology. And here we go. Maybe we just re want to rotate this in the Z axis. A little bit there. Nice. Okay. So I'm going to stop here because otherwise I'm going to just tweak this for ages. I love getting into this phase of a sketch and I really, I mean sketch in like the traditional way where you kind of have this idea in your head and you get it out on paper really quickly. Once you've built a system like this, it's, you know, it's playtime. You're just testing stuff and it becomes a real fun form finding exercise. Now on the course, we also have supplied a little material pack. So I'm going to go ahead and just append, append one of the materials from in here. Let's go ahead and make this out of shiny metal like this. Here we go. And I'm going to apply that material nice and easy here. Grab that in there. And I might also just jump into rendered view so that we can get a sense of what this looks like with a little bit of light. So I'm going to jump into my render tab. EV, change this to cycles, I'm going to set GPU rendering, denoising in the viewport, and then I'm also just going to add a ground plane, because that's always nice to have. Make that a little bit bigger here. Position it underneath this. And we can just have a look in cycles here and see what kind of things we can come up with. If I turn off the scene world, then we're actually going to get one of the default HDRIs, which can actually look really fun for doing stuff like this. All right. So I know this specific structure is not particularly kind of practicable with it being <laughs> so alien. However, the system that we use to build it is, you know, it's actually a very standard system of building curves and processing them as surfaces. You know, if I, if I bring this evaluate surface over that we made earlier and maybe just move it over in the Y so that we can have a look. This and this don't exactly resemble one another, but you can kind of tell how they go together, right? And sure, it's because we've set all of this stuff going on with our mirror and we can change that. That actually looks pretty cool there. So you can have a lot of fun with this. All right, I am actually going to stop now. So well done if you followed through with me to this point. I hope you've enjoyed this little kind of getting our feet wet with Sverchok. It's a really fun system to get involved in and Blender makes a really great kind of base system to work in. It's a lot of options for us working with animation and visualization on that side and using these procedural tools with Sverchok and also the modifiers that we have existing as well as we saw before. It's going to open up a huge number of form finding possibilities for you.
and you can create these really interesting live shapes. So here's a little bit of homework. What I want you to do is grab yourself a copy of Sverchok and have a play. Have a look at the systems that we've generated today using these curves and you can build something up as we did, just creating a regular kind of canopy and you can choose, you know, whether you go down the meshing in a more traditional route and using that surface sort of in a more direct manner, or you can do what we did with generating some kind of pattern on the surface. In this case, we did Voronoi and then instance an object across it, which kind of gives you this vestige of the original pattern while creating a generally pretty um, different looking surface. So there's so many options. It's almost hard for me to give you homework uh, with any specificity. I want you to create a pavilion. That's the goal here. Make some kind of installation. Think about human scale. Put it around about the size that a human would be able to walk up to it and interact with it. And most importantly, have fun. So go ahead and do that. Share it back with us. Post it on Twitter, Instagram, Discord. Make sure you tag us. And there we have it. Keep an eye out for the Spurchalk course. We go in a lot more detail about the... Uh, there's a lot of stuff that we skipped over here. And so we're going to take a little bit more time over that for the actual course itself. We have a number of projects that we go through and some basics at the beginning just to get everybody up to speed. So I hope you've had a lot of fun just working through this project, getting to know Spurchalk a little bit better. And I hope to see you on the course. I'll see you around.